I was talking with a owner of a record label recently, and he was telling me that the sale of CDs has started to go up again. And I thought, well, that's great news because I've always liked CDs. I didn't like them when they first came out, but I got to like them. And nowadays you can buy them secondhand for almost nothing. And it is a medium which will basically last forever and can give a lot of pleasure, especially with the little booklets where you can read up about the recording engineers and the musicians and the instruments and all that extra metadata. But yeah, well, I was pleasantly surprised. So I thought, well, maybe it's interesting to look at CDs, CD players, and make a little three-part video of the, the story, if you like. So here we are in part one, where I will share with you a little bit of background on the development of the CD, why it was invented, what were the, the circumstances for Hide It for the project team, and a little bit about the launch. And then in this video, I thought I would talk about 20 classic CD players. Now, okay, don't, don't shoot me. I'm not an expert on this. I've just made a cross section of CDs over time from the very beginning right the way through to the current day. And I thought, well, that might be interesting enough. And then in part two, I'm going to invite some people over, probably at different times, and we're going to listen to a lot of different CD players and try and analyze with and answer the question, could a 30-year-old CD player, or even older, outperform a modern one? And that we will explore, and I will use, as I say, a, a group of people, young and old. And then uh, in part three, I'm going to look at a few of them in specific detail and kind of do a little mini review of the ones that I think score the best in the in, in part two and then have a little summary in that one. So here we go. Let's get started. I think we need to go to the mid 1970s for our beginning of our story because the engineers at Philips down the road here in Leuven in Belgium had been playing with digital signal processing and they were looking for something to replace vinyl. And weren't we all, if we're honest with ourselves, those of us who were, have been owning vinyl for a long time, well, we used to get fed up with the crackles and pops and the surface noise, especially if you're unlucky enough to buy a, a piece of vinyl which was a bad pressing. I mean, I remember my friend buying uh, the Paul Simon's uh, still crazy after all these years album and I bought it and his pressing was way better than mine um, it wasn't consistent so here we were are in mid 70s the Philips engineers saying look how can we how can we make something that sounds better that's a lot smaller so we can reduce the size of equipment that could be portable um, that would never wear out um, and obviously could withstand big temperature changes because one of the things is obviously in vinyl in the very hot countries and in difficult climates it was a no-go. And also, wouldn't it be great if you could carry it around because the Philips team had already invented the cassette, which was very successful, but, you know, just didn't sound good. Um, so they were looking for all of these things all in one. And a guy called York uh, Senju was heading up the Philips team to develop what they came the compact disc. Um, and it's quite interesting, really, how these things work, because apparently in one day, in one meeting, they were saying, well, what size should we make the hole in the middle of the CD? And he put his hand in his pocket and, it, and he pulled out a 10 cents coin, a Dutch coin. And um, he said, that, that will do, make it that size. And, and this is sort of how things began. Well, budgets were obviously very big in those days because by 1979, Philips had not only developed the CD, but they'd also developed the laser system and everything of working it out and could actually record digital music onto a CD and play it back. And so excitedly, they had this uh, little device called 
the pin culture, they shot off to Japan to show this technology to other manufacturers. And if you look at it in retrospect, this was, I think, as I say, 79, they first went there. The first CD machines get released in October and November 82. I'll come back to that in a minute, which is incredible if you think about it. But in 83, 84, there were 400,000 CD players sold in the United States alone. So the opportunity was massive. But interestingly enough, when uh, Europe and his team arrived in Japan, the other big manufacturers were not interested. There was only one who said, yes, 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 we'll work with you to make a global standard. And that was Sony. And probably it was because they'd already started to develop a digital recording process. It was very basic. It used videotape and recording dots of light, basically. But they had actually developed a recording, digital recording process. So this was perfect. So they obviously signed some kind of agreements and said, right, let's get to work. Now, by October, um, let me just get my notes here, make sure I don't make, say anything wrong. And if I do say something wrong, please, you know, I've been doing some research, but I'm not an expert in this topic. So uh, forgive me if I refer back. OK, so the first CD player ever was the Pinkulture, which is what they nicknamed for it, which was a development model which Philips used and took with them to uh, Japan. Um, but the very first CD player itself was a CD100. Now, it was released after the Sony player. Now, I'll talk about Sony Player in a minute. And this is interesting because the engineers at Philips had worked out how to map sort of digital music. And they had come up with 14 bits as the basis. And their machine had a chip that was 14 bits. But Sony developed on their own 16 bits. Now, it wasn't necessarily because there was better quality. Well, there's lots of stories about it, and some say that Sony did it deliberately so that they could get their product to market. I don't know what the truth of these things are, but the fact is that Sony did get there first, and they released in Japan, but they held back because Sony and Philips decided to launch together worldwide. So the first... CD player that I want to talk about is the CD100, which finally gets launched in November 82 um, and the worldwide launch in March of 83. Um, now, this machine, as you can see, was a top loading machine and Marantz uh, launched it as well. Marantz were owned by Philips, I believe, at this time. I might be wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And they called it the CD63. And Grundig released one called the CD30. And um, so, but this device had some components from Sony in it, I believe. But obviously it had the very famous CDMO uh, drive, which Philips very quickly, when they went into mass production, updated to this, what they called the CDM1. And that was used throughout industry. Um, and as I say, it was basically an 8 to 14 bit machine. And it had an amazing laser system. And I think we should show this here because the laser used as little as one milliwatt. But Philips developed this system first, of course. Uh, so they, they developed this laser coming up onto the disc. And there was little indentations in the disc. And the, these, these are tiny. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly how. It, but it's, it's basically the beam focuses on something that's one micron wide. So the, you know, obviously the little indentation is a little bit wider than that to allow for tracking. So the beam goes up, it hits the disc. If there's an indentation, it sends the, the beam right back down and it reads on a photoelectric cell and that goes on or off. And the amazing thing is that just by doing a series of on-offs, you could map all of music and you could even map the left and right channel. I find that quite incredible to all this day. So it had a really fancy road and stock lens. It was beautifully constructed and it was used for a long time. But then 
at the same time, this is the machine that Sony released, which is, they called it the CDP-101, and I'm told that that's because they wanted to talk about ones and zeros, and they thought it was interesting to call it the 101. It was released in Japan in 82, October 82, and worldwide, together with Philips in March 83. So this was a front loader, much better to put into a rack system, and interesting, in those days, DAC, the DAC chips, the digital audio converting chips, were so expensive. Excuse me. <coughs> the digital to audio conversion chips were so expensive that um, they only put one in each machine instead of one per channel. 16-bit digital oversampling. Now, this was a nightmare for Philips, and it meant that was the reason why they had to delay, because... The CD with 16-bit on the 14-bit machine wouldn't work. So what Philips had to do was um, urgently come up with a solution to how to get theirs to work into 16-bit. And this is where innovation and human ingenuity is so incredible. Um, you could say it was a disaster because to produce a new chip would have taken, well, months and months, uh, which they clearly didn't have. So the engineers found a very clever way of saying, OK, what we will do is we will work on the bit level and we will oversample and we will sample it up and then bring it back down to 16 bit without having to change the chip. And that was incredible. And it meant that we had two forms of development, if you like, which have continued to this day, where you have some manufacturers doing lots of oversampling and others saying, no, no, let's just try and get it read right first time. So, so there was no oversampling in the Sony machine and the list price was about $730, which is in that time was a lot of money. I mean, it's incredible. And it had a multi-pin socket on the back. I, I haven't got a photograph of the actual socket, but you can see where it is. And the idea was with this multi-pin socket was that Sony thought that maybe there would be video coming from DVD CDs in the future. Um, so they allowed for this to be plugged into some kind of video decoder, but of course that never happened. So that's kind of it. And, and Sony had developed their own chip in that time. So from their first meeting with Philips in 79, not only had they developed their chips, developed their own laser system and their own uh, system and a whole machine, you know, it's incredible, incredible. You have to stand back in, in awe of how that how the Japanese were able to, at that time, with their skill and, and project management skills, to develop something in that period. Amazing. Now, my third one is the Marant CD34, which came out in 1985. Now, in this day, there, there was a lot of interchangeable parts with Philips. And actually, they used to say under Made in Japan, also Made in Belgium, because I think there was so much. And this had the four times over sampling because I think it was probably still using a 14-bit chip. I'm not sure about that exactly. Someone can correct me. Um, it had a beautiful, strong aluminium chassis built to last. Um, uh, you know, the beginning of something that we can recognize as a real CD player after the Sony one. Now... This is another piece. Obviously, as I say, in 83, 84, there were 400,000 sold in America alone. And you can imagine that the people at Technics suddenly woke up and thought, you know, and not just Technics, of course, all the other manufacturers. They said, right, we, what are we going to do? Are we going to use the CD mechanisms from Philips? Well, they probably weren't available because Philips were flat out making as many as they possibly could. So they decided to design their own CD player bottom up and every every component that went in the Technics machine from Mitsushita uh, was actually developed and made by the corporation for themselves. And I just find that wonderful. They've come up with a different sleeker, th typical Philips look and feel. Um, and they call that the SLP3. And that came in 1985, I say. And it was a very expensive machine because obviously you think of the cost of the engineering. They weren't just engineering, you know, one component. It was a whole invent. Number five for me is the TIAC P1 D1 1987. And this kind of 
formed the basic for the later esoteric models. And esoteric was the sort of very high-end um, TIAC. But in the beginning, TIAC was high-end, and it even had the word, I think, esoteric on the front. Now, the whole concept of this was the separate boxes, which we see today in many designs, and I will come back to them later on, and we will look at a few in, in number two and, and part three as well. Um, and here, you see, they, they designed this to be vibration-free. They, they think that vibration is a real problem, and they really want to make this thing vibration-free, and it's very, very solid, and typically, you can say, over-engineered in many ways for the Japanese. But this is early days, right? So number six is the Sony CDP X7ES. Now, I'm spelling that one out fully. It comes, we're in 1989 now. And this has to be, in a way, the Rolls-Royce of CD players. And I think if you own one of these now, you're a very lucky person. These are very, very expensive today on the second-hand market. There are a few others that are a little bit much, a little bit more expensive, excuse me. But this this one is really incredible. Look inside it. They copper line the whole system. They separate the power supplies. They have their own dedicated dig, dig, transformers. You see them digital for just for the digital circuits. They're here, they're saying, what can we do to make it better? And every single component is being looked at and, and, and optimized probably regardless of whether it makes us an audible sound improvement. They just think, well, if we make this thing perfect, then it can't sound worse, right? So this was their flagship model, and uh, it had a, a, a really a, a, a sort of metal beam structure for the chassis to make it really solid. And one very, very interesting point, it had balanced outputs. In 1989, balanced outputs. I don't think anyone would have been using them in those days, but it was foreseen. And it'd be very interesting today to actually have one of these things and try it out and see how the balanced outputs work. Number seven from 1990, we've moved ahead a little bit now, to the Meridian 206. This, I think, was really, really ahead of its time. I mean, when, when, you, when you look at the the design of this thing with its two separate chassis uh, and the DAC and the electronics and one for the mechanism. I love this, you know, so the DAC and the electronics in one box, the mechanism in the other. And they used what they called, there was a firm called Crystal. I don't know if they exist still. And they, and they had a bitstream chip and they used for this. And these, these units could be bolted together. It was very, very innovative work, although a bit crude, I think, compared to some of the designs we've seen before. I mean, crude in terms of, you know, the look and the feel of, of, the, of the finish on the outside, but a very capable machine. Um, so that was, the, that was the, the, the Meridian. Now we're on to the Yamaha, number eight. And this is now 1991, okay? And the Yamaha called this monster the GT CD1. Well, CD1 is obvious. GT doesn't mean Gran Turismo. No, 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 no. This means gigantic and tremendous. I mean, that's hilarious, right? But if you look at it, it's probably the most beautiful CD player ever made, right? And it was built on a non-floating rigid structure. So the whole of this structure was about solidity, mass, no vibrations. I mean, where have we heard this before? I mean, this is all coming from turntable uh, ethos, isn't it? It used a three-beam laser. So the first CD players were using one single beam, but they worked out that with the three beams, they could work out the positioning of the laser uh, and also, you know, back skip and do all the other things because, you know, when you have to go back, if it's a bad bit of CD, a bit of dirt, they can back skip and pick up the data from somewhere else, put it in. So there was a, advantages in going to three beams, and this one certainly had it. it had a high torque brushless motor. Where did we hear about this before? Turntable technology, of course. And it had, again, balanced and RCA outputs. What did it weigh? 24 
kilos. I mean, that is a bag of cement. It's incredible. So you, it's a beautiful looking thing, though. I mean, I would I would like to have one. I think it would be nice. We could make a pair of Sibelius speakers to match the woodwork. A really beautiful thing. So my number nine is the Denon DPS-1, another gargantuan, giganticum machine. It's a it's from 1993. It's a transport and they have a separate DAC. Now, the transport weighs 17 kilos and the DAC weighs 20. So you've got 37 kilos of technology here. Um, it's again designed to eliminate vibration, which they thought was the, the enemy of the CD. Um, the sand cast alloy chassis and constructions five digital outputs which it had coaxial toss aes bnc optical st i mean brilliant i mean it was really <laughs> moved forwards the cd mechanism was built by a company called victor and it used the same one as the previous yamaha it was they shared the same one obviously this was a, a piece of engineering a wonderful piece of engineering but now I want to move to 1993 and the complete antithesis of what we've seen recently. For my number 10, it's the Quad CD67. Now, this is typical Quad, British understatement. There's no buttons or controls at all on this device. There is actually a secret little button just in the front underneath where you can push to switch it on. And the little black triangle area is actually to, if you push that, you can eject the CD and put it back in. Why is that? It's because basically um, Patrick Walker didn't, Peter Walker didn't want dirty finger marks all over his nice equipment. So he designed remote controls for all of that process. But in theory, you could put the CD in and you could close the door and that was it. Now, the in, why do I list this one here? Because it's small, it's not particularly heavy, and at the time it got rave reviews for its sound quality. They were saying things like about how natural and, 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 and sounding it was. Today we would say it was very vinyl sounding. It was, they say it was smooth and the mid-range and the voices were lovely. Um, and, and there was much less talk about the technology, although they had brought out a CD player before, uh, I think in 1989, if I remember correctly, and it looked exactly the same as this, and it was called the CD66. Um, and that basically had all Philips interior workings, but by now they'd developed all their own electronics, still using the Philips uh, machine uh, in the mechanics, but the electronics was 16 times oversampling. They had actually done, oh, sorry, not 16, 64 times oversampling, of course, and 18-bit streaming they were able to caper with. And the total harmonic distortion on, the, on this machine was probably just as good as any other at 0002, uh, 002. Um, the crosstalk was incredible figures because everybody liked looking at figures and comparing figures. It was more than 100 dB. I mean, it was basically unmeasurable. And it had just, it was considered and still is considered by many to be one of the best sounding CD players ever. And I got one. So I'm going to bring it over to the listening room and when we have the sessions for part two, I'm going to put that with some of the other machines just to see if it's true. Maybe, maybe it's not. is Cyrus. Now the I put these two together because uh, they both came out very similar. Cyrus made their first CD in 1994 and Cyrus were based in Huntingdon and so were Quad. They were both based in Huntingdon which is a town sort of near uh, Cambridge in the UK and Cyrus were owned by Mission and you know Mission from their white-fronted loudspeakers, their famous loudspeakers, Mission Electronics brought out a brand called Cyrus and they made these lovely 
what I call half width machines, CD players and, and amplifiers. And of course, when I first saw them, I thought they can't be serious amplifiers, they're too small. But of course, Cyrus is a very serious a company who made great equipment. And I've got in touch with them and they've brought me over some of their more recent machines. And those are some of the ones we're going to look at in number th in, in two and part three as well. So it's a top loader, of course, this very first one. And interestingly enough, it has an external power supply. And that's why I've included it, because Cyrus really believe that like, taking all the power supply out of these machines makes them much quieter. And they use, go for what they call first time right, you know, read it right. And that's what they want to do. And they're still working to that philosophy today, which is great. I was talking to Seri, one of the R&D engineers from them, but more for that in part three. So, you know, they used the, the in the first one, the CDM uh, from Philips, uh, the machine, the version nine, uh, the mechanics and why not? It was considered an industry uh, standard by then. Now for something completely different. Um, number 12 is the Bio Sound 9000 and it came out in 1996. And look at it. It's wonderful. Now it's very in your face. It's very, I, I see it as Scandinavian and it's just a sort of, you imagine white walled interiors and very sort of sleek furniture and yeah, I don't know, wooden floors. And, and it was designed by a guy called David Lewis and it was launched in 96, as I say, and it has this sledge on it that could move across and pick up to the, go to the CD and let the CD spin and play the CD along. And it could be displayed sort of vertically, horizontally. I'm told it could be mounted in eight different ways. Goodness knows how that was or how it worked. But, you know, was it design, visual design over technology? I don't know. But I have a sneaking suspicion that because it was a CD, it probably sounded pretty good, maybe as good as any other. But we will find out in part three and in part two, sorry, what the difference is in sound between these machines. If I don't get a B&O, at least we can compare with very different types of machines. For number 13, we have the Riga Planet. Now, this is an interesting one because it came out in 1997. And Riga have been making their planar, planar turntables for a long time. And they were very, very late coming to the CD world. And if you think about it, and if you think about the owner and designer for the business, Roy Gandhi, and how serious he was about vinyl, he didn't actually like CDs when they first came out. And a lot of us didn't either. And I think that's why he delayed. And he was watching and looking and listening at what everybody else was doing. And at a certain point, he must have thought to himself, you know what, I can do better than that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a CD player to market that will be reliable, that will sound really, really good. And it won't be too expensive. It won't be ridiculous money. And so they were reluctant late adopters, I think. Um, but there's nice little touches about it, like in the top, there was a clear, it's top loader, of course, you can see in the picture here, but there was a, like a, a clear vinyl cover. So you could see the CD in it. I mean, how many times, how many times if you wonder, you see there's a CD in, the, in your player, but you don't know, and you can see, oh, it's got 14 tracks. So, oh yeah, it might be Beatles, Please Please Me. So, you know, Roy had seen that. He thought, no, let's make the experience as close to a turntable experience as possible. So you, you push a button that the top nicely lifts up. It comes up nicely. You put the CD on and the top goes down nice and gently and clicks into position. Beautifully done. Um, all damped. And then he worked with Burr Brown, the chip people, to, to come up with something really, really nice. Uh, and they came up with a, something that I thought that he thought would um, be good value for money, as I say, and, and, and just sound great and work for year upon year upon year. So 
Let's take a little pause here just to move forwards 20 years. Because we could look at every single CD player that was invented, and there were so many in that 20 years, that we now move right the way forward to 2016 or thereabouts. And back to Quad. Let's see what Quad were doing from their sleek, very plain 67 looking machine. They come out with something called the Artera Play. Now, I've chosen this because I, I have one at home in, in my one of my listening rooms at home. And I find it a really good machine. I've got the Play Plus and this is just the standard one came out and they use the Sabre DAC um, from um, ESS Sabre. It's a very famous DAC. Um, if for those of you who are interested in the numbers, it's an ES9018 DAC. Um, it was 32 bits of 384 kilohertz. So now we're going right up from the 14 bits of Philips to 38 potential. And it can go all the way up to DSD 256. It had digital inputs. It had optical, of course, outputs. It got the RCA outputs, got balanced outputs, just like those machines from a long time earlier. But by now, in 2016, balance is beginning to take off. Um, digital outputs, you know, it's, it's just a very, very nicely made machine. But it's basically a preamplifier. And I liked that because the early machines like the, the Sony X7 series had variable outputs. They put in variable outputs and that meant you could connect directly to a power amplifier if you wanted to or at least you could when you plug them into a preamplifier you could balance the, the sound level so it matched your turntable or matched your tuner or, or your reel-to-reel -reel tape machine or your cassette machine. So when you switched from one medium to another, you didn't have these massive changes in volume. I like that. I like that. And you'll see in the one of the later in, in part two and part three, I've chosen a, a project um, um, CD player to, to look at because it matches has a very dedicated preamp, which also has a variable output, and it's very useful for that purpose. So let's get back to this one. Number 15 is the Griffon Ethos CD Player DA Processor. I mean, look at Griffon. I mean, they are, have a reputation for being not just outrageously expensive, which they are. I mean, this is, I think, $39,000, this, this CD player. It's an incredible amount of money. I might be wrong, but it's a lot of money. But they take great pride in building something to the perfection level and something that is stylistically unique. When you see a, a Griffon product, you know immediately that's what it is. And people will very proudly buy these because why shouldn't they? If they have the money and they want to do this, um, they, this is something that sits in your room forever. Now, they use in this device not their own um, CD reading mechanism, but they use one from a company called Streaming Unlimited, and they're from Austria. And it's, it's this, this uh, player is obviously dual mono, class A out. Um, and as I say, it's an extremely expensive machine. Um, but... It's followed by my number 16, which is the Project CD Box RS2T. And this is just a transport. It's a typical little project, a little box, as you see, the square box shape, aluminium, also made in Austria. Um, and it uses exactly the same mechanism as that Griffon. It uses the uh, CD Pro 8 from the same company with the Blue Tiger CD84 servo board. So technically, the workings of that transport are the same as the Griffin. Um, it has I2S master clock syncing with its uh, uh, preamplifier, of course, and the DAC so that you, the, the DAC can, can, can link and clock and control everything. So it has an external power supply like the Rigas do. And it's... Uh, sorry, the Cyrus, uh, so not Riga, Cyrus. And it may not look impressive, but technically it should sound really impressive. 
And that's what we're going to find out in part two and maybe again in part three. You know, so that is it. This is the way it works. It's a, that's my project. And now for number 17 is the latest Cyrus, because I think it's interesting to see how they evolved over the years, because there's not so many companies where you can see this fact that they've stuck to their guns. You know, OK, now it's front loaded. Um, Again, they have the same philosophy, keep the power supply outside. You, you can plug in a power, but use an external power supply. And they have, it's not just one voltage going in, they have different voltages going into the, the different components. Um, and I think it's a very interesting approach and I'm looking forward to listening to one. Um, it arrived this morning. So it's, again, twin analog outputs, all the rest of it, the sort of things that you would expect. And you can see that the design hasn't changed massively over the years, and it's so typically Cyrus. Now, it's, it's, it's competitor, it's British competitor for my number 18. We've got the Riga Saturn. It's come out this year, I believe, 2023. Um, it's the Mark III Saturn using a dual Wolfson DAC. Um, it looks lovely, and the, the quality of the chassis is fabulous. So I think it's going to be a very interesting thing to sort of compare this with, with the Cyrus products. Um, you know, all, all the usual features that you would expect in a modern, in modern player. Now I'm going to set the cat amongst the pigeons, if you don't mind that expression, because we've seen some very, very, very expensive machines. And I just want to put some balance in here. And today I'm going to show you a picture of a machine that you've probably not even considered. I've never seen one before, but I ordered one today, just before coming into the studio to make this video. And it's my number 19. It's a Philips TAEP 200. I thought it would be interesting to compare where Philips are today compared to one of their first or the very first Philips model. And I've got a very early Philips machine coming to the listening room in the next few days. Now this Philips TAEP 200 is actually a DVD player, but it has analog out and it has coax out. And I'm just wondering how good it, it can sound. It has a remote control and it costs 49 euros, including delivery. So it's going to be delivered tomorrow to my house for 49 euros. Is it possible that this machine could sound anywhere near the modern machines? Now, I don't want to upset anybody, but I just think it's an interesting question that deserves an answer. Because if you're a student and you've got no money and you want to listen to great music, Buying one of these machines, you can also play DVDs from your dad's DVD collection. You can get your CDs, as I say, from the secondhand shop or whatever, or borrow them from your dad. Uh, and you theoretically, you might well be able to hear something which for a reasonably good or very good quality for a very low price. But we will see. Maybe it's a complete disaster. So my last one um, is a Sony Walkman Discman. Now, this is the thing that's interesting. This is one of the latest models or the later models. I bought it secondhand on eBay, again, for 25 euros. And you, you think, well, why am I, as a serious hi-fi freak, even thinking about talking about this? Well, the reason is simple. The moment that Philips thought of the CD, think of the Pinkelcher, the early little demo, they wanted something small, but they wanted something mobile. And they immediately started designing a CD player that could withstand being shaken whilst playing. So all of the machines that we've seen where they're talking about anti-vibration, all of these things to make a better sound. Well, this machine, and I've tried it, it has a line out. I can play it and I can shake it like this and it will keep playing. Now, I'm not going to talk about how it sounds, except for to say it wasn't bad. 
until the next one because I want my panel to listen and to make a decision for themselves. But it just shows you that in 1984, one year after the first CD player came out, they launched their first one. It didn't look quite like this, but we've got a picture of it. We'll show it to you. And the idea was to make something, as I say, that you could shake, go off jogging with and play. And the interesting thing is because this one has a line out as well. OK, it's a, it's a the small jack. You can play it, plug it into your hi-fi system, which would also be another solution for students and people with not much room. So that's my very, very last one. You might think it's a bit of a joke. They made the last Walkman or Discman in um, year 2000. But I hope you've enjoyed this. As I say, it's not a, a, a complete list by any sense. And maybe I've missed something which is so obvious and please let me know in the comments. But I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to you joining me for part two where we will start comparing and answering that question. Can a 30 year old machine sound as good as the best ones? How would this, for example, compare with a really good modern machine? Um, and my listening panel, what models would they choose to take home with them? So until then, enjoy your music. Bye.